Okay, I think we're ready to get started. We've uh, got close to 100 people on this webinar and um, hopefully some others will be able to join us, but uh, I know that everybody's time is uh, tight these days with all the Zoom meetings and other webinars that you can join. Um, and I know that our presenters today have a, a great topic and a lot to talk about, so we want to allow time for questions um, as we go through this. Uh, so how can you advance to the next slide, please? All right, so I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar uh, from Freedom. My name is Ken Delaney and I'm the Director of Industry and Innovation here. We are a Power Systems and Power Electronics Research Center at NC State University. Our research projects span renewable energy integration, electric vehicle technologies, control techniques, microgrids, applications of wide band gap semiconductors, and traditional power systems analysis. We have extensive lab capabilities, including multiple simulation labs for HIL development, an electronics packaging lab, and a high bay lab for evaluating medium voltage applications up to 15 kV AC input. Together with our industry partners, we are leading the electrification revolution. Hopefully, everyone is familiar with Zoom by now. Uh, we have disabled audio and video for all participants, uh, but we ask that you use the chat feature to ask questions. Just hover your mouse over the Zoom window and the button should appear at the bottom of that screen. Click chat, type your question, and we'll answer as many as we can um, as we go through. I do want to note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, Terry, that's a comment to make sure you hit record. Um, and uh, we will uh, put this video um, on the North Carolina State Electrical and Computer Engineering Department uh, YouTube channel in a few days. Um, I do want to say Freedom conducts some amazing research uh, but our students and postdocs are even more amazing. So I'm going to turn things over to our first presenter today. Okay, um, thanks, thanks, Ken. Um, hi, everybody. This is Hao Feng, and uh, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at Freedom Systems Center. So the other presenter is Dr. Kai Wang. He's a PhD candidate with Freedom Center. So today we'll talk about the um, concept, design, and development of medium voltage based extreme fast charging system. So this is a DOE founded project and Dr. Sergey Lukic is the um, principal investigator of this project. So uh, the big background is the uh, massive penetration of electric vehicles. So before we have a uh, high power density and very reliable and inexpensive battery uh, technology, we will still have to rely on the battery charging facility to supply the uh, electric vehicle but the um, charging infrastructure, our uh, infrastructures are uh, facing a lot of critical technical challenges. So the first is that the um, EV charging station is a substantial load and its impact on the power grid can be very significant. So any extreme fast charger should be able to control their power factor to help mitigate the uh, voltage deviation and should be able to uh, drop their load in case of any contingency on the grid. So that's basically the requirement for low demand, uh, demand management. And further, if any significant generation source resources are available at the charging station, the extreme fast charger station should allow for bi-directional power flow for them to plug in. Um, DOE recently has set up a goal to fully charge a vehicle within 15 minutes, which demands our charging power higher than 315 kilowatts. So fitting a load at hundreds of kilowatts requires a huge grid side capacity facilities, including the uh, step down transformers and the metering. And that's a major source of the system footprint and cost. So going over the existing charging infrastructure, it's apparently that we don't have such a facility that can achieve above requirement or avoid the uh, mentioned issues. So therefore we are proposing a one uh, megawatt uh, charger that connects directly to the median voltage distribution line. So the system will consist of a solid state transformer, <coughs> SST, that creates a shared DC bus. So to which multiple vehicle and storage unit can connect. Um, the system will be protected against the uh, uh, using the solid state DC circuit breaker here. So each vehicle will interface to the DC bus through a DC node, basically DC DC converter, allowing charging the 15 kilowatt to 315 kilowatt range at the uh, vehicle battery uh, voltage. 
So apparently the most essential part in the system is the solid state transformer, SST. So the key capability of the SST are the ability to manage the power quality and deregulate by directional power flow in response to the command from the vehicle, both from the utility. So the DC distribution here also provides a more flexible interface for different form of energy source to plug in, since it directly connect to the uh, medium voltage grid. So there's no need for a bucking inefficient step down transformer. And so largely reduce the uh, system footprint and power uh, conversion losses compared to the state of the art. So the smaller footprint allows more you know, compact installation, which significantly reduce the uh, installation cost. Also higher efficiency reduce the operating cost by uh, delivering more to the, uh, uh, to the vehicle side. So since we're talking about the solid state transformer, um, uh, we'll be uh, focusing on the hardware side today. So first I will, first, uh, I will re uh, briefly introduce the overall diagram on proposed XFC, and then I'll uh, we will elaborate on the power electronics design and development. So to begin with, we will first introduce the architecture of the solid state transformer. So the uh, proposed solid state transformer connect to a 30.2 kV Light to line input voltage and deliver 715 volts DC, uh, DC output. So, in order to block the AC voltage using available uh, power electronics, each phase we will have six modules in series to share the AC voltage. So, in three phase, we will have totally 18 modules and their output are all paralleled. So, within each module, there is an active front end, basically, an AC DC converter and the dual active bridge that serve as a isolated DC, DC stage. So in terms of the control architecture, uh, normally for two stage AC, DC plus DC, DC converter, the inter intermediate DC bus is regulated by the front end and DC, DC control the power flow. But in the proposed uh, SST, if each of the AC, DC is regulating its own uh, intermediate base bus voltage. So then totally 18 DC bus information needs to be processed by the uh, central controller. So to minimize the communication requirement, <coughs> the AC DC uh, uh, stage will only regulate the power flow and the uh, power factor. So naturally its current reference here is generated by the DC output voltage. And meanwhile, DC DC stage here, it has a local uh, controller. So it basically acting as a voltage follower to guarantee that the voltage ratio on the medium voltage side and the low voltage side, they follow the uh, transformer turns ratio, which is the um, optimal operation condition for the DAB. So next we were uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the uh, active front end design. Uh, I will leave it to my colleague, Dr. Wang. Thank you, Jason. Hey, Dukai. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, I got some technical problem. I, I'm okay now. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Dakai Wang from NC State University. I'm a PhD student at Freedom Systems Center. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about the design and control of active front end. I will first uh, briefly introduce the control strategy for the active front end. Then I will elaborate on a small but interesting technical uh, we, uh, technique we proposed for the serious connection of sitting car by MOSFET. So uh, for the active front end control, we are using a central controller as mentioned previously by Dr. Fong. Uh, so this controller will generate the power reference based on the low voltage DC voltage. Then the power will turn into the current reference to generate the PWM for the active front end. So uh, we use the stationary frame kind of compensator uh, to do the control, also compensate all the harmonics. Uh, for each module, we got two bit encoded PWM signal to do the modulation. 
for each modules in the active front end. So uh, since we have two bridges in each hard module, so it means two control freedom. Uh, therefore, the two-bit encoded PDRM signal is uh, good enough for our local control. Uh, so for the background of active front end, uh, as Dr. Fong previously introduced, we have a total of 18 modules arranged in six levels for three phase. So for each phase, we got six levels and 85 kilowatts for each hard module. The DC bus for each module is 2.15 kV. Uh, but as you know, uh, today the commercially available sodium carbide MOSFET uh, the highest voltage is 1.7 kV. So we need at least two of these kind of devices in series to withstand the 2.15 kV DC bus. Uh, so I'd like to give a short review on the series connection state of the art. There are mainly two categories uh, for this kind of technique. One group is the dream source site solution. Uh, this solution uh, mainly uses the passive snubbers such as the RC or RCD, uh, but it suffers the high power loss, also has uh, bulky passive snubbers. For the gate side solution, uh, another group, another group, it suffers the complex voltage sensing and uh, it has advanced gate driver, requires advanced gate driver. Uh, that means you need to sense every VDS voltage for each sitting uh, carbon MOSFET or other active switches, uh, which make, makes it very complicated. Also, you need the active uh, advanced gate driver to tuning the turn on and the turn off age. So uh, our proposed solution is a hybrid active and passive uh, serious connection technique, uh, which only has small passive snubbers, also eliminates the complex voltage sensing. So uh, this is our proposed uh, topology. Uh, for the passive clamping part, you can see here, uh, this is the clamper circuit. We only need one clamping circuit for the serious connection of sitting carbide MOSFETs in each bridge. We got four devices and only one clamping circuit. Also, the power loss on this clamping circuit is only one watt uh, for every 10 kilowatt output power. Uh, it's a negligible power loss. Uh, this is the passive part. Uh, it looks like the flying capacitor topology, uh, but the operating principle is totally different, I will introduce later. Uh, this is the active gating we need. It's a predefined uh, modulation. We only need the standard gate driver, a very simple gate driver, uh, as well as ESP with high resolution PDRM, because we are uh, going to tuning the rising and falling ages at a nanosecond level but it's predefined. We do not need to adjust it during operation. Uh, this predefined modulation uh, is based on the rectifier effect of flying capacitor topology, uh, which is a very interesting point I will introduce uh, in the, uh, later. For this method, we do not need voltage or sen current sensing. Also, uh, we do not need control for the voltage balancing. So uh, now I'd like to introduce the operating principle uh, based on the rectifier effect of flying capacitor topology. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this table, it lists all possible switching states of the flying capacitor topology. So uh, some of the switching states, like the two or three, number two and number three, uh, normally for flying capacitor topology, they will use these two states, sense the output current direction and do the balancing control. But uh, most people do not pay attention to other switching states during 
this period. So uh, basically, we eliminate all the switching states. That means four switching states, two, three, six, and seven, which has possibility to discharge the flying capacitor, uh, which means we remained five switching states in the red color, which ensures the flying capacitor current from the load current uh, is always positive or zero during a very short interval. And uh, this switching states, the current direction of line cap is independent of output voltage or current. So it's very powerful. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, go over every state, switching states during one switching period. So as you can see here, in the first uh, period, as you can see here, no matter what the load current is positive or negative, uh, it do not have effect on the flying capacitor. For this switching state, when the load current is negative, it could charge the flying cap, but when it's positive, do not have influence. For this switching state, uh, also do not have influence on the flying capacitor. Uh, in this switching state, when the load current is positive, it could charge the, the flying capacitor. This is the last switching state, uh, so do not have effect on flying capacitor. So uh, I'd like to uh, draw a simple conclusion for the rectifier effect of flying capacitor topology. That means uh, as long as this delta T, this time period, this four time periods, are positive, the flying capacitor current will be always greater or equal to zero. Uh, so uh, 30 is the effective time interval to charge the flying capacitor. So the shorter 30, the less power loss on the clamper, which means the clamper will clamp the flying cap voltage to half of the DC bus. So less delta T means less, less stress on the flying capacitor. Uh, also, we need a assumption to analyze the power loss on the clamping circuit later. So here uh, we could see if uh, the load current IO direction is unchanged within one switching period. That's the assumption which is most of the case. So you could see here two of the four delta T will be zero, and the other two will equal to the load current within this delta T period. The red one is the flying cap current. The blue one is the load current. So this one will uh, help us to estimate the current uh, flow through the clamping circuit. So how to design the clamping circuit? Uh, first, the clamping voltage is approximately half of the nominal DC bus voltage. This is the equivalent circuit of this clamping circuit. It's uh, the PBS here, which means transient voltage suppressor. It has the uh, equivalent series resistance here. Uh, as long as the uh, as well as this flying cap, it forms RC low pass filter for this current source. It's the load current. It's like current source. So this one forms the low pass filter. Uh, based on the simulation, we tuning these two values to make sure the voltage ripple on the flying capacitor is less than one percent of rated voltage at full power. Uh, so uh, this 1% is, could be adjusted uh, based on your requirements. Also, uh, this startup resistor are less than the resistance of V1 uh, below the breakdown voltage. And also it's large, very large, large enough to limit the leakage, in, leakage current 
flow through this register. So uh, based on the assumptions we made before, the current direction is unchanged within one switching period. Also, the dead time is negligible compared to the switching period. We could uh, calculate the startup circuit uh, leakage current here, which is the voltage, voltage difference on this resistor divided by the resistance around the 0.1 milliampere. Also, we could got the average value for this clamper current. Uh, so it is, it's depended on the delta T we talked about before, also the switching frequency and load current, plus this startup circuit leakage current, we got the clamper current. So if the delta T is one nanosecond, switching frequency 20 kilohertz, the output RMS value is 8.3 ampere. We could got the clamper leakage current 0.4 milliampere, also the power loss 0.4 watt. So that's the design for the clamping, clamping circuit. Uh, this technique uh, or topology could also uh, this, do some extension to the serious connection of 2N ceiling carbide MOSFETs. Also the switching pattern could be extended very easily. And this technique uh, could also be applied in other ECDC topologies, such as the isolated resonant DC AC converters, or isolated DAB converters, or other multi-level isolated DC AC converters. So now it's the experiment verification part. Uh, as you can see here is the 10 kilowatt prototype we built for the first version. We are working on 85 kilowatt version now. It's under development. So uh, you can see this is the flying capacitor we need. It's in 45, 40 package. The size is mainly, the size is very small. Uh, also it could handle two kV isolation. The capacitance is only 68 nanofarad. So here just to demonstrate the small size of our clamper circuit. Uh, the TVS transient voltage suppressor, the volume is uh, almost the same as this flying capacitor. So the total size is very small. Uh, here, is, here are the experiment waveforms uh, we got based on this 10 kilowatt per type. Uh, as you can see here, here, the first picture shows the steady state voltage balance of the series connection, series connected MOSFETs. This is the VDS, VDS voltage for the top MOSFET. This is the VDS voltage for the lower MOSFET. Also, the third and the fourth channel are the output voltage and current. Uh, the output power is 10 kilowatt in this case. Also, a uh, zoom-in waveform, you could see the good uh, balancing, also the good dynamic balance. Also, the voltage spike for the inner MOSFET is uh, very small due to the minimized commutation loop. Uh, as you know, the commutation loop of flying cap, flying cap topology could be very small. Uh, here shows some voltage reading for the outer MOSFET. Uh, this one could be optimized because uh, this hardware, we modified it to flying cap topology. Previously, it's an NPC topology. So the loop is a little bit small. But in our 85 kilowatt version, the loop is very small, so this one will be better. Uh, now is the experiment for the power dissipation on the clamping circuit. As you can see here is our two TVS in series. Each of them is around 500 volt clamping voltage. So uh, how, to, uh, how to get the power loss 
on this TVS based on experiment. Uh, you do not want to measure the current flow through this because it's very small current. Also, the it's high voltage, medium, medium voltage. Uh, DC bus voltage 2.15 kV. So uh, we came up with a solution to measure the power loss on this TVS. We measured the temperature of TVS uh, under different power, different leakage currents and voltage, get the power loss. So based on this table, uh, we could get the temperature of TVS during experiment then we could get back to get the power loss on TBS. So you can see here, uh, this picture is after 10 minutes running because the uh, thermal capacitance of the circuit is very small. So the, after two minutes, uh, the temperature is stable. So this uh, 10 minutes period is good enough to get the steady state temperature for TBS. You can see here it's 33 degrees C. It's between these two numbers. So uh, we get a rough gas, 0.25 watt for each one. So it's 0.5 watt for two of them. Also the power dissipation on startup resistor is on the, under this control board. Uh, also very small, it's around 0.1 watt. So, uh, that's all for my part. Let's head back to Dr. Fung. Hey, Dukai, thanks for that. Um, how We do have a few questions related to some of your earlier slides. Would you be okay to answer those now or do you wanna wait till the very end? Yeah, sure, I can answer it right now. Okay, um, and this one has to do with uh, one of the very early slides that um, where you were showing the overall uh, diagram uh, the layout. Um, and it had to do with the bidirectional and unidirectional breakers. So here's the question. Do those bidirectional and unidirectional breakers equate to bidirectional and unidirectional power flow? Uh, yep. So, uh, so basically, uh, the, uh, Yeah, we are employing, we are deploying the uh, bi-directional uh, breaker here and the uh, unidirectional is uh, actually there's a, actually this functionality wise, this, this, is, this should be also the uh, bi-directional uh, breaker. But uh, in, in our first stage of development, we are using the, the unidirectional breaker uh, to, to realize the, the single, single directional charging vehicle to charge the vehicle. But actually, the uh, in, in the final uh, development will be uh, the bidirectional breaker is still needed here because we are we are trying to uh, like uh, you know, discharge the, the vehicle and to uh, uh, to transfer energy to the, to the grid. So okay. yeah. So the design is eventually going to allow vehicle to. Go. Yeah, yeah. So V two G is very critical uh, objective of for this, for this project as well. Okay. Okay. And then um, there was a question about the communication protocol. Um, are we using, uh, what, what standard communication protocol are we using or is it proprietary? Uh, actually right now we are, uh, we are all the communication uh, to, to just, just, just to, uh, uh, just to mention that all the communication was uh, performed by the uh, optic fiber. So basically here we are, uh, and it, had, it doesn't have to be a very uh, timely communication. So uh, it, had, it, can, it can sustain a, a little bit delay. So here we are, among all the modules, we are using the CAN communication. Okay, and I, I should have been more clear. Are we using the Chatamo standard or oh, the CCS? Oh, you are, you, are, you are talking about the, uh, the, uh, the protocol to the, the vehicle here. Right. Yeah, so this, uh, this depends on the um, different different type of vehicle, like your yeah, Chatmo and CCS. The uh, that that relates to the uh, that relates to the combo design, which means to uh, which means relate to the to the plug uh, to plug design. And here we're just trying to uh, design the the power converter stage, and and if we can equip with the um, this, this suitable uh, plug-in, 
and uh, you should be able to charge any type of vehicle compatible to the CCS and, and Chatmo. Okay, okay. So that's, I, I mean, that's critical for being able to communicate with the cars when you when you plug in. But at this point, that's not um, not yes. something that we're focused on. Or do we have? Uh, is that a later stage of the project? Um, that should be the, the, the final stage of the project. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then one more question and I'll let you get back to your slides while we collect some others. Um, how did we decide the DC bus voltage? And, and what does it, does it depend on the number of modules that are there or what's the deciding factor? Okay. So, um, so here, as you see, we split the, um, the uh, input AC voltage into, into six modules. So each of the modules are logically uh, the input voltage here, AC input voltage here, the RMS should be around 1.2 uh, kV. So according to the, uh, the modulation index of the, uh, the we, we are trying to um, limit our modulation index of the AC DC converter within a reasonable range. So if you are, uh, uh, and, and also it is a boost converter, right? So, uh, so given that the, uh, uh, the suitable DC voltage here should be around uh, 1.8 kV to uh, 2.2 kV. And also, um, also this uh, backend is DC DC converter that each of the, uh, the switch can withstand uh, 1.7 1 .7 kV. So uh, we thought that the uh, operating at 1, 1 kV to 1.1 kV for each of the devices uh, should, be, uh, should be reasonable. So get back to the uh, the total DC bus voltage here should be two should be from two kV to two point two kV, and here we choose the uh, one point two point one five kV as uh, uh, fall within that that range. Yep. Okay. Great. We've got some other questions, but we'll save those for the end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'll continue with the uh, uh, design, the, with the design the development of this DC stage. So basically at the right side of the, uh, the page is the uh, topology of the uh, dual active bridge. So the uh, medium voltage, DC voltage, as I mentioned just before, is 2.15 kV and it is the, uh, uh, so each of the, the devices, the article, they can take, uh, uh, 1,075 volts. So this is a reasonable number for the switch to withstand. <clears throat> and the output DC voltage is 715 volts here. So basically this type of converter, they can uh, create voltage source and on both sides of the transformer. So these two voltage source has a phase and amplitude difference. So the power can be uh, transferred bidirectionally through the uh, leakage inductance of the uh, transformer. So it doesn't require extra circuit component, very simple and reliable solution. So since the uh, input and output voltage of the uh, DAB converter are fixed, so this transformer turns ratio is three to one uh, uh, to roughly match the voltage ratio on two sides. And also the uh, medium voltage input voltage, as I mentioned, 2.15 kV. So we are using the three level full bridge here to have the voltage stress on the uh, devices. So commercially 1.7. KV module can be used. On the low voltage side, instead we are only using uh, a regular edge bridge as the upper voltage is, is uh, relatively lower. So regarding the control and modulation of the DAB, um, since we have a roughly fixed voltage on both sides, so we are not seeking a very complicated modulation. We are only using the phase shift between the uh, medium voltage and, and low voltage to regulate the power flow. So one issue needs to be uh, noticed is that the uh, three-level converter requires the upper and lower voltage balancing control. Here we propose a novel bi-directional phase shift modulator. So firstly, the uh, voltage controller will generate the PWM signal based on the voltage on the two sides to generate the, the PWM signal to, to, the, uh, to the modules. And then, uh, then the second harmonic oscillation uh, on the medium voltage bus is eliminated, eliminated by the uh, resonant compensator here. 
So on the other hand, the modulator will slightly adjust the dead time here between the inner switch pairs to keep the voltage balance. So this method can deal with the bi-directional power flow and also can will not affect the voltage uh, second across the transformer as you see here compared to the regular uh, modulation and the uh, voltage cross uh, voltage second cross the transformer stay the same. So basically totally independent from the power transfer and also the flux balancing of the, um, of the transformer. So I'm not going to cover a uh, uh, detailed conduction mode here. So you can find out the detail in our recent publication, which I attached here. So in terms of the device selection uh, um, here, the uh, 1.7 KB uh, 325 ampere silicon carbon module from Cree are selected as the uh, uh, main switch on the medium voltage side. And on the low voltage side, we are using uh, 1.2 KB 300 ampere silicon carbide module from Rome. So the clamping diode here, uh, we are using the fast recovery silicon diode module from ISIS. So this selection uh, based on the device's rating availability and also the cost. So we've done some loss analysis. Um, according to the loss analysis, it shows the DC DC efficiency can reach up to 98 point 9% at the switching frequency of 20 kilohertz. So when the switching frequency goes up, um, the efficiency difference is not that significant as you see at the 15 kilohertz, the uh, efficiency is still 98.3%. But the uh, major problem is that the uh, extra losses will almost come from the transformer. So this will pose a very huge thermal stress on the transformer. So based on our material and cooling method we are using, uh, this transformer, if operating at uh, 15 kilohertz, will, will sustain very high temperature. <clears throat> so uh, we've selected 20 kilohertz as the uh, switching frequency. So the downside is the uh, uh, switching capability of silicon carbide. Uh, most of it is not fully utilized. And the 20 kilohertz makes the size of the transformer um, very large. So the power density uh, will decrease um, so basically it's a trade-off among the efficiency of power density and also the thermal limit. Um, I'd like to mention here that the switching frequency here is not fully optimized yet. So we will continue to explore the design trade-offs and finalize the um, optimal switching frequency. So another um, critical design metrics of um, silicon carbon converter is that the, is the commutation loop because of the very high DBDT during the switching period. So we may see a very high uh, voltage overshoot across the switch if the uh, loop inductance is large. And that can even kill the switch, the devices. Yeah. And in this design, we've considered the size and also the path of the uh, commutation loop. As you can see on, the, uh, on this diagram, it is the longest commutation loop that represents the worst case. So in the real physical setup, we've delicately designed the loop so that the most of the traces, the current flowing through, um, their direction is opposite, so that the uh, magnetic field of them can be canceled by each other to reduce the loop inductance. So to verify the loop design, we've done some um, tests under the full voltage and full power, and we checked the waveform during the turn on, turn off switching transition. So for the uh, outer switch, uh, we are paying attention to the moment that it turns off, um, so they're blocking around 1.1, 1.1 kV at the uh, the steady state, and we can see the uh, uh, we can see the overshoot here. The switch moment is around uh, 120 volts, so up to 10 percent of the 1.1 kV. So it's a very small percentage for the silicon carbide. And also we can uh, observe the uh, for the inner switch, which is the worst case I'm I'm attaching here. So for the inner inner switch, it is the it is a hard hard turn on. Uh, situation, and the, uh, the at the turn on moment, the oscillation here is very negligible. So, which means <laughs> the looping docking is also very small. So, based on this uh, design technique and principle, uh, we can manage to uh, to regulate our uh, uh, loop design and to make sure that is within the uh, uh, acceptable acceptable level. So, for uh, uh, for the for the full scale uh, prototype in the lab, we built the uh, 
uh, the setup including the medium medium voltage converter transformer and the uh, low voltage converter. So the converter is tested up to uh, 95 kW and which is 15% overloaded. And the DC, DC efficiency is measured at 99.9%, which is very um, close to our calculation. And this result also uh, uh, indicates that the efficiency curve can be very flat in the high power range, and which means the uh, high efficiency can be reached uh, within wide range of power. And we've also um, tested the um, temperature of the subsystem running for, uh, for a reasonable amount of time and uh, medium voltage and LV and low voltage units are cooled by, uh, by fans. And the hotspot here is within uh, 70 degrees. So, so, there's, so certainly there's no uh, uh, significant concern about this prototype. And another innovation uh, I'd like to highlight is the uh, high isolation power supply. Uh, so for the medium voltage application, the auxiliary power supply is uh, very critical because uh, for, the gate drive, for the gate drive power supply, it needs to provide a high isolation level. And also the uh, coupling capacitance of the, of the, of the auxiliary power supply uh, needs to be minimized to reduce the common mode noise uh, coupled to the control circuit because of the very high uh, DVDT generated on the, uh, on the power side. So originally we were using the convert, uh, conventional uh, transformer structure uh, with a toroid decor and the windings attached on, the, on, on, on two, two, uh, two ends. But uh, here we proposed a, a novel concept using a loosely coupled uh, transformer. So the high side and low side are totally uh, separated and wrapped by the potting material. So this potting is very critical to its reliability and constant system performance uh, uh, during a long time operation. So the partial discharge inception voltage uh, reached, uh, reaches 15 kV, which is the, uh, as, as far as we know, which is higher than the uh, existing commercial product. And the parasitic capacity is measured at 1.2 picofer, which is also lower than most of the available ones. So basically this new developed uh, high isolation power supply will guarantee a better reliability and also performance of the uh, overall system. And finally, I'd like to attach the overall picture of the uh, complete SSD module as we built, uh, we have already built uh, one complete module in our, in our lab. As we build more modules and push to higher power, there will be a more uh, interesting testing result coming up so hopefully we should be able to uh, share those details in the near future with you. So thank you very much. That's pretty much my part and uh, any question from you. Excellent. Uh, Takai and uh, Dr. Fung, thank you guys very much for your uh, presentation. We have a lot of questions that have been rolling in um, and I need to let uh, everybody that's been active on the chat um, no, we've had a couple of students uh, from Freedom that have been answering some of the questions as well. So we appreciate uh, those. One of those students is a wall who is um, also active on this project. Um, and so uh, how I'm going to ask you some questions uh, uh -huh. and, and you, you may have addressed this, but what is the overall efficiency of the system? So the overall efficiency I'm, um, I'm mentioning in this page is the, the DC, DC, uh, DC to DC efficiency 98.9. .9. And the uh, AC, DC efficiency, we haven't taken it to the full power, but according to the estimation, uh, Dakai, can you give us a number of the estimated efficiency? Yeah, our power for this? cognitive efficiency is 99%. Yes, 99%. Then 99% uh, uh, times 19, around also 99%. So the overall AC, I mean, grid to battery efficiency should be uh, around 98%. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, and this is another bigger picture question. Um, is the project goal to obtain IEEE 1547 compliance? Uh, and that has to do with bi-directional connection to the grid. Uh, 
yeah, that's a honestly that's a hard one. And uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we've we've checked out some um, uh, some uh, interactive standard regarding the uh, the isolation and also the uh, power quality, but but honestly, we haven't uh, so we haven't. Uh, think about the uh, the IEEE 157 uh, standard as you as you mentioned. Uh, so probably yeah, we were looking into that. Okay. Um, when you're exploring the optimal switching frequency, um, what's the loss model of the transformer? Yeah, great. That's a that's a fantastic problem. And uh, the last model of the transformer, basically, we are still using the uh, the Steinmetz equation. So basically, and so basically, you you choose the material, and you know what's the index of the uh, uh, the loss factor, and uh, and and, uh, and we can we can iterate on the different switching frequency, and also based on the information of the flux density, so we know what is the uh, what is the precise. Uh, what is the precise loss in the uh, in the transformer? So in the in the real setup, we won't be able to verify that directly. Uh, directly, what's the loss in the, uh, in the in the transformer? So we, we can we can only test up the uh, the uh, temperature rising of the transformer to uh, uh, to verify whether the loss is within our uh, uh, expectation. Um, okay. D do we have um, an idea for the the potential size of the complete one megawatt system? So, so sorry, can can you repeat that that question? Do we? How large do we expect the full one okay. megawatt system to be? How large? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So uh, I'm showing the only one of the complete module here. Uh, I can tell you the size of the uh, the length of the uh, the bottom support is around uh, two meters, and the width of the uh, and width of the uh, the bottom support is uh, around uh, eight eighteen uh, eighteen centimeter. Yeah, eighteen centimeter. So so imagine like you know we have we have six of this in stack. Uh, in stack, and we have three of these shelf uh, placed next to each other. So that's around the size of the uh, of the whole system. Yep. And that will be the size of our uh, full one megawatt SST. Yep. But then you've also got the protection devices. You've got the DC DC converters for each charge port. Oh yeah, the uh, the DC DC uh, node. Should be uh, a DC DC node. Um, there's another enclosure for the DC DC node. I'm not attaching here, but the uh, the, the circuit breaker, uh, circuit breaker. They they can be easily integrated within the uh, the SST, uh, given the uh, given the if enough space we have here. Yeah. So okay. so so the so the solid state uh, breaker is not occupy occupying extra space. And on a bigger picture, I don't know that we've mentioned this, but um, we do have uh, industry partners as part of this project. Mm -hmm. um, ABB uh, is providing some of the equipment and then uh, the New York Power Authority will actually provide the host site uh, for this full size charger. And I, I don't know exactly the physical location, but we know it's gonna be in New York State. Yes, correctly. Okay. Um, so yeah, so what, uh, again, big picture, we're in year one of this project or year two? Uh, we, is it, is it about how many, how many, how many participants in this project or? Uh... No, what year of the project are we in? When, when are we okay. supposed to have things okay. complete? We've, we've, st we've started building this prototype uh, starting from uh, uh, September last year. But the, and this, and uh, if you are asking the when the when does this project uh, start? And uh, it starts at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of two two thousand nineteen. Yep. Okay, so the goal is to have everything installed by twenty twenty two. By next year. 
by next year. So 2021 yeah. sometime. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So we are, yeah, we are really hurrying, uh, fabricating more of these modules and pushing to higher power to reach the milestone. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I am perusing some of the questions and I'm actually going to, uh, you guys can maybe check a wall here and see if you agree with some of his questions um, or some of his answers. Uh, there was one question. Hang on. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, um, is, is withstanding a lightning impulse of uh, 95 kV, is that included in the front end design? And a wall uh, answer included? was the medium frequency transformer in the dual active converter is designed to provide the 95 kV BIL. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, insulation is probably one of the most uh, critical, yeah, and uh, critical issues in the in this system, and uh, we have pay a lot of attention to that. Um, and then there was a question: Can the PIR make secondary har second harmonic voltage completely zero on the DC bus? Um, and a wall said we've experimentally validated that the PIR eliminates the second harmonic voltage oscillation almost completely. Yes, um, zero optically, zero optically should be able to fully uh, to fully eliminate this the second harmonic order in the uh, second harmonic repo in the uh, in the medium voltage DC bus, and so that that means the the second harmonic powers, they are all on the transformer. So we will see a, a huge uh, uh, 120, 120 hertz envelope current in the, in the transformer here. But the size of the, since the ripple here is totally removed, so the size of the capacitor can be very small. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a question about core material for the medium frequency transformer and uh, Dr. Manaz Khan answered that, the ferrite core. Um, and then how is the flying capacitor bridge topology superior to a normal H bridge topology in terms of power carrying capability? Uh, yeah, we also tried the NPC topology, uh, but uh, you know, we have six modules in cascaded, so the uh, power level or equivalent switching frequency is uh, already good enough. Uh, for each power module, we run at five kilohertz, and the we have twelve control freedoms. That means twelve bridges, so it's sixty kilohertz equivalent switching frequency. So uh, we want to make the module design as simple as possible. So if it's multi-level topology, we need the voltage balancing. Uh, control or also the big size of if it's flying cap we need a big size of flying capacitor uh, so this one makes the problem more easier also the cost we use the to 247 package it's a very low cost solution mm. and Dakai, yeah. this may be a related um, question, is there any performance comparison with the conventional multi-level topology? For example, with the conventional three-level phase shift full bridge, um, because we said the proposed technique can be applied to other multi-level DC-DC. Yeah, uh, the pri this technique is actually a serious connection technique. So to increase the uh, nominal voltage to withstand a higher voltage, uh, you could apply this technique. Yeah. Uh, for multi-level topology, it has higher equivalent frequency, also uh, less, uh, more voltage steps. So uh, it's a trade-off, I think, between the uh, one is the cost and complexity. Another one is the uh, performance, the more voltage levels and uh, switching, higher switching frequency. But we already got six modules in Cascade, so the switching frequency is uh, not a big problem. Uh, 
Okay. Well, um, I'll tell you what, the, uh, the questions have kind of slowed down a little bit online. Um, and thanks again to the students that have been uh, monitoring the, the group chat to help us answer those. Um, we did have one question about will the slides be available? Um, and uh, Dr. Fung and Dakai, I'm assuming that's okay. Yeah, sure. With you guys, yeah. So we'll plan to put those up on the website um, later today. Uh, and like we mentioned, this webinar is being recorded. And so the recording should be available on the NC State Electrical and Computer Engineering YouTube channel um, pretty soon. It, it takes a little while to process the Zoom files. Um, but uh, thank you guys for doing a great job. We had, you know, over 100 attendees um, that stuck with us. So uh, very good topic and uh, thanks for the update on the research. I do want to let those um, online know that uh, Freedom is making this a regular uh, event. So um, but hopefully we'll get you guys an email pretty soon indicating when our next uh, technical webinar uh, will be uh, sometime later, maybe June, maybe we'll do it in July. Uh, we'll see. But thank you everyone for joining us and uh, have a great day. All right. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you.